And it's 1001, and I'll just start by introducing myself. My name is Tess Macenti, and uh, I'm the collaboratory librarian. And I'm so excited to introduce Anna Fort. She's going to be showing us some visible mending techniques, which is a um, it's been around for a while, but it's been trending lately. And it's a it fits right in with with um, the spirit of the collaboratory, this idea of reusing and making things beautiful um, and using your skills and honing your skills. And um, our co-host today at the library is Serena Davis. She's in our collaboratory right now. And if you peek behind her, you can see there's a 3D printer going. We've got a silhouette, glue, a silhouette a die cutter back there. And uh, we're excited to start getting that space ready for patrons in the coming months. Uh, let's see, we've got quite a few people in, it's 10.02, and so I would just like to introduce Anna Fort, thank you for coming and for showing us um, your magnificent skills. I'm super excited to be here. So I'll share my screen. So hopefully everyone can see it now. So visible mending with Anna, that's me. Um, visible mending is trending. It's a newer trend. It's meant to be a more temporary fix to a rip or a hole in your garment. It saves money. It helps keep clothing out of landfills. It gives you a satisfaction of creating art on your garment. Instead of hiding rips and tears, the visible mending movement turns them into art. Um, it's born out of the Japanese art of shashiko. Visible mending enables crafters to shun fast fashion and make your mistakes beautiful. You can add stitches to ready to wear garments, then add a creative touch. It's as easy as sketching a basic design with a re an erasable fabric chalk. Choose some fun threads or yarns. Choose a stitch that you want to try and start stitching. Uh, give it a light press of an iron at the end and your basic garment becomes personalized pizzazz. You can see here how uh, this just basic top, she did some stitching and created a little sunburst on one side, it's super cute. So before you sew, there's a couple things that you should do. Stabilize your fabric. This prevents puckering and holds the fabric reasonably taut and it will help clear folds. An embroidery hoop is perfect for a large area of sturdy fabric, but if you can't find one to accommodate your piece, Try an adhesive freezer paper or a tear away or a wash away stabilizer. And just, oops, I went up too much. Um, just as for real estate on your garment, it's about condition and location. So a simple small rip in an otherwise new fabric will hold up once it's mended. However, for a torn through area that you're likely to wear through it again. Surrounding the fabric might also be too weak to hold the repair, so you should try to anchor a few stitches far enough away from the hole or the weak spot so they don't have or so they have something to hold on to. And then no loose ends. Long floats or stitches and unsecured patches can tear up and catch and rip again, and it can leave it worse than what you started with. So be sure to stitch down or trim away any extra fabric on both sides. Keep it short. Small stitches are more secure than long loose ones. When you thread the needle, resist the urge to pull off a long piece of yarn or thread. 
nothing anything longer than your arm's length is going to start tangling so short and sweet um plan ahead it can be difficult to stitch the design of your dreams freehand but you can help yourself out use a wash away marker to sketch the design before you start stitching or draw on the freezer paper or stabilizer if you're using that help your yarn slide through even worsted or spun threads or yarns can be abraded by stitching and catch so use beeswax to condition or lubricate your yarn or thread and what about washing consider the combination of your fabric your yarn or thread and the washing method to mend a denim which probably makes many trips through the washing machine almost anything goes non felting fibers retain their shape but for a fa a favorite chambray shirt a felted patch might turn into a puckered mess due to the shrinking of the wool against the cotton what about supplies or materials that you might need woven scraps of fabric work great um i always have a pack like I cut off the legs of jeans or I have quilting cotton patches laying around. You'll need needles. There are Shashiko Japanese needles. They're a bit longer and a bit stronger than embroidery needles, but embroidery or hand stitching needles will work just fine. Heavy cotton thread, embroidery floss, or darning cotton or yarn will work. Scissors, of course. Optional items like a thimble, a needle threader, some beeswax, a fabric pencil or raceable chalk or a washable fabric marker, an embroidery hoop, some fabric stabilizer or interfacing, and then a coaster or a scrap of cardboard. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So here's some basic stitches. A running stitch there at the top is just a basic stitch. A back stitch is a little bit closer together and has a little bit more stability underneath. A straight stitch for designs so that you can make a flower or a sunburst to kind of cover a hole better. A chain stitch is just a different kind of a back stitch, sort, sort of. Um, it works better on things that have a little bit of stretch to them because a chain stitch has a little bit of give in the movement. A stem stitch which is good if you need to make designs or loops, it's easy to do. A satin stitch for filling in, which is just a bunch of running stitches right next to each other. A split stitch is a variation on a chain stitch. Then you could do French knots for texture and design, fly stitches for texture and design, a feather stitch is really fun and then if you google basic embroidery stitches there's a million more there's all versions of blanket stitches and cross stitches and it's just you can get crazy i usually start off with a basic running stitch and i practice my satin stitch and straight stitch because i tend to have more holes than tears So this is how to do a basic running stitch. You grab your needle and thread, and you can stitch your thread doubled up or single. You create a running stitch by inserting your needle through all the layers of the fabric when you're sewing. Remember, you wanna load up your needle with multiple stitches at a time, 
and your fabric should gather up on your needle as the picture shows. So to achieve even stitches, make sure the puckers and pleats on your needle are relatively the same size and spaced evenly. And then you pull your thread through to reveal your running stitch. And you can repeat until your chosen motif is complete. So this one's just a little square. And then you tie off your thread, knot it on the back side of the fabric. Traditional Japanese shashiko stitching is approached a bit differently than basic Western embroidery. Shashiko stitches are marked by their smooth and even geometric motifs and can be more easily achieved when you load up your needle with multiple stitches as if you're pleating instead of creating a running stitch. And I'll show you, I have a project example at the end where um, my friend did a great shashiko stitch on her jeans. So some methods, and methods generally fall into two categories. You're either covering something up or you're filling in a gap. So a stain, if like I'm notorious for dropping coffee down the front of me. So a stain would fall into a cover up category and most likely a decorative stitch can fix that. But a hole in your clothing falls into the filling in the gap category. So using a scrap of fabric to patch on the inside, or you can use a fabric patch with some fusible interfacing to do a patch on the outside. And then you can stitch along the edges to close in the gap. So here's some example of an outside patch and an inside patch. Decorative stitching can also be used to cover up or fix things. Um, lots of small stains, like I said, can be covered up with fun stitching, like rows of zigzags or a straight stitch in a starburst or flower pattern. Stitching over weak or worn spots will help stabilize them and slow down further tears. Decorative stitching can also follow the pattern on the fabric, like outlining the little flower or stitching along the shape. So this is a project that um, my friend did where her button on her overalls was pulling out. You can see it on the right. And so this would be an example of an outside patch. So she trimmed away the threads around the hole and then cut a piece of fusible interfacing that was larger than the hole to iron onto the garment. And she made that fan shaped piece of fabric and got it in as tight as she could around the button. And then she just stitched the edge, folded the edges under and stitched and then kind of did a fan sort of stitch to hold the patch down and stabilize the area around the button. And then when she closed the overalls, she thought it looked weird that part of the patch was showing, but part of it wasn't. So then she hand embroidered a little flower on the front of the overalls to match the little patch piece that was showing. So as you're patching and you finish up and you look at things, then you can add more patches or more stitches or an embroidery just for fun to make it look more artsy and cohesive. My second project was thinning jeans. So the front of her knees and thighs were really getting thin and she was afraid it was going to tear. And so she actually removed the inseam on the jeans so that she could lay the jeans flat and do the hand stitching. So she did a big patch on the inside and then she did all the little decorative stitching. And this is a really good example of a shashiko stitch. And then afterwards, she put on a couple of patches on the outside just for fun. So 
be creative, do inside patches and outside patches. Um, just make sure if you have a hole that you're stitching all the way past the edge of the hole to secure it past the weak parts. And then this one is a worn cuff. So this is a fantastic old Pendleton wool shirt that is just seeing better days, but the little edge of the cuff inside was wearing down and the hem was starting to fray. And so we just put an outside patch and kind of wrapped it over the edge to keep the shape of the cuff. And when it's buttoned, you don't really see it. And most of the time I feel like she wears the shirt with the cuffs rolled up anyway, but it just prevents the wool from tearing and wearing any further. So here's some pro tips. Um, when you're mending the legs of pants or arms of shirts, insert a coaster into the pant leg or sleeve underneath where you're stitching to help from accidentally sewing the leg or sleeve together. And that's what I was talking about before getting a little coaster, a piece of cardboard to put inside. And that it's super annoying when you forget and then your sleeve is sewn to itself or you forgot that you were sewing on even the leg of your pants when you're sitting on the couch and I've sewn my project to the shirt I was wearing and it's just super annoying. So make, it's a good tip. Um, and then another thing is if you tend to be a freestyle stitcher, that's great. Just get in there and go for it. But some of us are super planners. And so doing a freestyle thing, I feel like it doesn't come together quite right. So I like to plan and mark out guidelines. So I have um, a fabric marker that's washable and I also have chalk that just erases off. And so I like to draw out what I'm doing or at least draw the perimeter of the area that I need to stitch down. And then I have some resources. And so all of these are um, super easy resources. Um, I put the hashtag visible mending because I follow that one on Instagram and it's just amazing what comes up. But sometimes if you don't know what you're, how to do whatever project you're doing, that's a good place to get um, examples and, and ideas. So I'll come back to real life now. And I just wanna show you a couple of things that I keep around. Um, how many of you know what this is? I was gonna say Serena knows. I think I know, but I could be wrong. I'm really guessing. Is it, a? I wanna call it a darner. Yep, it's a darner. So these are, um, old things that you used to put your sock over so you can darn your socks. And I found this at a little vintage shop for like two bucks and I totally use it all the time because it's also great for elbows and knees. Just if, or if you have just a little bit that you want to stitch on, a little wooden darner. Sometimes they don't have a handle and it's just like the egg shaped part and they call it a darning egg. But these are super great tools for hand stitching. It's interesting, I've noticed that people are fussy about their thimbles. Some people wanna have the old metal thimble. Um, there's new, like silicone rubber thimbles, which I'm always afraid my needle's gonna poke through. But I got this, this thimble that's amazing. I'll see if I can hold it still enough. It's from Dritz. And so it's just at Joann's or Michael's. And the dark green part is a rubber 
that's flexible. I don't know if you can see that it's kind of flexible. But then this the front part here is very hard, but it also has little perforations in it. So your needle your needle won't slip off of it. It actually goes into the hole and you can push the needle through, which I like. Some of the old metal thimbles have a texture that's really good for that too. But I like this thimble just for general purpose. And then um, I, it's so hard to show. I, like needles, I just keep a pat. I keep a bunch of patches already cut, just on hand, and some needles and a couple pins, and I have different sizes of needles, um, like different thicknesses of needles, different eye eye holes. Because if you're using a heavy like embroidery floss, then you need a bigger eye than if you're just using a regular thread, sewing thread. So I, you find what works for you. And I just keep a couple of different ones handy. Um, if you have something like this blue fabric is a little bit thinner. And so I like to use a thinner needle so I don't punch big holes in it again. But then like just a general cotton, I have a couple of cotton patches that I just always, I have a box of random patches. But this one, the heavier ones are good for, um, they'll take a thicker needle and a thicker thread. Um, what else? I have a, oops. The one that I did the stitches on, I, oh, look, you can see. It's very, um, it's, it's a loose, it's woven, but it's very loosely woven so you can see through it. So when you punch your stitches in, it makes quite a big hole in it. So um, like if, I, if this was on a garment or this was my garment, I would definitely make sure I put a stabilizer behind it because every time when I stitch, it just makes the loose weave get even looser. So you kind of have to look and see what, what you're using. Um, I ha Sometimes when I'm watching TV, I just sit and like put ribbons together or pieces of fabric on fabric and make little patches. And then I put this in my box. So I don't know. If an elbow came out, I could use this patch on that. So I sit around making patches and random sewing things. It's it's crazy, I know. Um, what else? Scissors. I just have little embroidery scissor snips that I mostly use, but I have um, you know sewing shears or pinking shears as needed. Because if something's ravelly, then you definitely want to use a, a pinking shear. And I, I have several friends that just love to cut everything with rotary cutters too. So I also have a um, rotary cutter that has a pinking edge. So that'll get a good edge if you're doing a big piece. And then a regular rotary cutters. Um, needle threaders. Since I'm well, I'm not quite old, but I'm getting older. So I have uh, the traditional needle threader, like I'm sure everybody's seen. And then I got these other ones when I found when I found my thimble. Ooh, I don't know if you can see it here. It's a piece of plastic, but it's got a very long, a long side. So it goes through the needle really well. Although it's the the shaft part is a bit thick for a small eye needle. But this is a I feel like I can hold on to this one better. Sometimes I get this one feels too small to me. And then of course I feel like these little ends 
pull out a lot. But so there's all different kind of needle threaders, patches, darning, whatever. Does anybody did anybody have questions? There was a question. It's a really good question. When using embroidery floss, how many strands do you recommend using? Does the item being mended or embroidered determine the number of, of strands recommended? And this person is a bit advanced. So that's the question. Ah, so I would say that um, the number of threads that you use doesn't depend on what kind of fabric it is. It's more about what kind of stitch you're doing and what kind of look that you want. Because if you use like an irregular embroidery floss comes in six strands. And so you can pull it apart to two or three or however many you want. And so if you're doing a stitch that you want to use little tiny stitch length and more of them, then maybe less number of strands just so you get a better stability. But if you want a chunky look or you're doing French knot, a bunch of French knots for texture, then maybe you would want a whole embroidery, all six strands. Did that answer the question? That sounds like a good answer to me. That was the only question in the chat, unless anyone has something they'd like to put in there. There's a lot of great ideas and beautiful, beautiful, great ideas. This is so cool and helpful. You're getting a lot of good positive comments, Anna. Oh, good. I, um, yeah, it's just, I, I think the things that are most important is, um, figuring out how to stabilize the area and on um like i have a friend who went to goodwill and got a sweater that had moth holes in it and so on a sweater that's a really knit you can't can't always use a stabilizer and so that's when you have to use a lot more creative stitching or put a patch over like she did some hexagon shaped patches and made like a honeycomb looking thing that was super fun. Um, oh, wait. Uh, somebody asked, how do you stabilize a torn hem? So um, a torn hem, it depends on the fabric and where the where the tear is. If the tear is at the stitching point, like hems are usually rolled up and stitched. So if it's at the stitching point, you can put a thin layer of interfacing behind it and iron it on and then do your patch on the outside or vice versa, do a patch on the inside. If the very edge is the part that's fraying or tearing, then like I showed with that sleeve cuff, you can do a patch that actually folds over the edge and then you just stitch around the edge of the patch. Let's see, do knee patches require special techniques since they need to move so much? Um, not necessarily a special technique as much as making sure you get enough space around the weak part. Because if you don't, if you have a weak, thin area on your knee and you're just still stitching and adding patches inside of that weak area, it's just gonna tear worse. You have to make sure your patch is big enough to go out to the stable, thick part. So it'll hold on and help it not wear. If that much. Oh, post it on the YouTube channel. Yay. I feel like I still have a whole bunch of time left. Well, I think you've answered a lot of questions. I know. I was, oh, the, the presentation will be available. So the resources will be there too. Because 
it's super fun to just go look online and see how people do stitches and different um, patching techniques. It's amazing. What is the YouTube channel you're talking about? What's it called? It's Hillsboro Public Libraries. Oh, yes. OK, great. I'm gonna, I believe I'll grab a link and I'll put it in the chat. Uh, it won't be there until tomorrow. But um, but I'll just put it in there if you want to just um, have it for, for later. Thanks, Tess. Yeah. <laughs> what an amazing sewing room. Ah, oh, it's a pit of despair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you. Um. What else? Did I make the dresses? Oh, okay. So this is totally off topic, but the pink one on this side is actually, um, I for my work, I have to travel overseas. And so I had a friend in China and she actually sent me, it's a Chinese silk dress for my daughter when she was that size. But the one on this side I made and it's a, um, it's a silk jacquard and it's like a 20s style tea dress. It's a folkwear pattern and it's called the afternoon in Paris dress. And I wore it for a couple of, I don't know, out to some plays or something, but super fun. I'm more of a garment sewer than a crafty sewer, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Is, oh no, my friend didn't. Uh, oh well. Oh, now I don't remember if my friend made it or not. It was a long time ago. My daughter's older now. <laughs> anyway, organization is good. Lots of little drawers and bins in your sewing room. Although, if you could see my floor, it wouldn't be that exciting. <laughs> Anna, I'm really blown away by everything that you've shared. I have learned so much. I was snipping and saving a lot of your slides. I was going to say, I, I hope I didn't talk too fast. I practiced a couple times, but I was like, I feel like I talked too fast. I think you did perfectly. I think it was wonderful. No, and I have, I, I got all the friends in my office are super excited about hand sewing now because I was like, okay, who has stuff that they made and did? Because I want pictures for my presentation. And I was amazed at how many people brought stuff in. And Well, if there are any more questions, otherwise, Anna, if you'd like, I suppose, and I'm not sure, Tess, is it okay if there's no more questions that we can maybe go ahead and... And yeah, we can stop the recording um, and like uh, hang out or people can leave. There'll be another session coming in, but not until, oh my gosh, 11. Well, the other session will be on the other Zoom room. So, um, so yeah, if there's no more questions, you're free to leave, take a bio break, come back for our next session, um, which is at 11. It's a cookie cookie flare um, decorating, cookie decorating session with one of our staff members, Mary. Um, she has made these incredible beach themed cookies. I wonder if I can share the screen. Even if you didn't register for it, you can still just find the link on our, um, on our um, event page and just join um, when she starts that at 11. Um, let me see, I'll share my screen to show you guys. So these are actual edible cookies <laughs> that are incredible. And she used a lot of the things that are in our library of things. So they're things that you can check out and, and borrow and use. Um, 
I wouldn't even dare try. I don't have that level of detail in my skill set, but I'm pretty excited to, to 